A reading from the second letter of Paul to Timothy. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of this and warn them before God that they are to avoid wrangling over words, which does no good but only ruins those who are listening. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead, even the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Good evening and welcome. What a wonderful crowd. I know why you're here. You're here for the soup selection. Good news, it's, veg it's vegan chili. So that's available immediately after the service. 
We welcome you. We're very glad that you're here. Those of you who are joining us online, we're so glad that you're here with us as well. And I know a number of people here for, are from other churches, as if this is your first experience at Evensong. We hope you'll join us again sometime. We're here every week. Uh, we're also blessed to be joined by Bishop-elect Ann Jolly after the service. That will be at 7 o'clock in Cathedral Hall. Uh, if you're joining us, uh, if you're hoping to grab a quick bite between the events, you're welcome to do so. There's a lot of people here, which is wonderful. You're, you didn't hear this from me, but if you feel a need to sneak out just a little bit early to grab a quick bite, that's okay. You Believe it or not, nobody can see you when you leave out here. It's an amazing cloak of invisibility. Uh, I just a I encourage you to watch the live stream of this service afterwards because anything you miss, I believe me, you'll want to see it uh, at a later time. We're so glad you're all here with us this evening. We're coming up to just a week and a half away from the beginning of Holy Week. Palm Sunday will, uh, will be the first Sunday in April, which means we'll also have solemn, uh, the solemn Eucharist at 5 p.m. that evening. Blessings, and we're so glad you're with us. Father Alex Martin, uh, the rector of St. Barnabas Bay Village, is our preacher this evening. Welcome. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. So the saint that we are commemorating tonight on our liturgical calendar is James de Coven. He was a, an Episcopal priest in the middle of the 19th century. He was originally from Connecticut, attended General Seminary in New York City, my alma mater, before he ran off to Wisconsin. And he spent a couple years at Neshota House, but spent the bulk of his career as the warden of Racine College. And this is uh, a, a, just a slight aside, but Racine College had one of the very first college football teams anywhere in the country and played the first college football game anywhere in the Midwest. And as, as a Buckeye, it pains me to say that they lost that game to the University of Michigan. Um, but I found a bit of comfort today because the Buckeyes did knock off BJ's Tar Heels in the uh, women's NCAA tournament today. So God is good. Um, <laughs> But Racine College, they called it the Sewanee of the North. You know, there was one time when uh, they noted that there was no Episcopal school uh, between Kenyan and the Pacific Coast except Racine. And it carried on for, for some time, but in the 1930s stopped offering degrees, and it has been transformed since then into the DeCoven Center, which you can still visit today. If you head up north, the DeCoven Center, they do educational programs, they do conferences, they do retreats, and so James DeCoven's legacy very much lives on. But I think the legacy during his life that he was most associated with was his affiliation with the broader Oxford movement. In our Anglican tradition, we, we talk a great deal about being a via media, a middle way between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. And of course, throughout our history, the, the pendulum has swung one direction or another. And the Oxford movement emerged at a time when the pendulum had very much swung in the Protestant direction. So this Oxford movement emphasized the Catholic heritage of our faith. And it took off across the church. And we often think of the Oxford movement, I think, in, in overly simplistic terms. But we often associate it almost exclusively with ritualism this sort of high church liturgy, you know, an excuse for, for men to, to dress and drag and put on pretty vestments and <laughs> ring bells and, and swing incense around and do all this, this, this pretty high church stuff. And that was all important, but I, I think that is a limited understanding of what the Oxford Movement was all about. I think what the Oxford Movement did well at its core was that it pointed people to Jesus. That was the goal. That was the goal of the, the, the ritualistic liturgy, was to point people to Jesus. That is what James DeCoven certainly understood. It's what he wrote about. It's what he preached. It was pointing people to Jesus. And yes, that, that's true in the liturgy. 
in the beauty of the liturgy. You know, that's why Christians built these beautiful cathedrals, was to show people a glimpse of the divine, to show people a glimpse of something otherworldly. That's why choirs sing this incredible music and, and produce this beauty, is to show us glimpses of Jesus. A few years ago at Canterbury Cathedral in England, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but a few years back, their mission statement was just three words. It was show people Jesus. I don't know if you've ever been on a a parish committee to write a church mission statement, but they usually end up some rambling, long theological statement that no one knows what the heck it means. And so I love that Canterbury Cathedral boil it down to three words. Show people Jesus. And I think that's what the Oxford movement got right. And not just in the liturgy that pointed people to Jesus, but also in the slums of London and caring for the poor, caring for the sick, the persecuted, the marginalized, all of the ways that we are called to live into our faith, to live into our baptisms, and to show people Jesus. That is what James DeCoven understood the mission of the church to be. I think that is the legacy he leaves us, and that is certainly our Christian vocation as baptized people. Now, that's true in in beautiful cathedral settings. That's true in the ways we live out our various ministries. That's true in the monotony of our daily life and work. So may we this day embrace our Christian vocation, the calling of our baptisms. May we honor the legacy of James DeCoven And may we make it our mission to show people Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Together let us say prayer two, found on page three in your service bulletin. Be present, Spirit of God, within us, your dwelling place and home, that this house may be one where all darkness is penetrated by your light, all troubles calmed by your peace, all evil redeemed by your love, all pain transformed in your suffering, and all dying glorified by your sin. May the peace of Christ, which passes our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.